Hey guys, this is Mario again, coming at you with another review as part of Monster Fest 2012. Ha 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 ha. Today's review is a movie that I've actually done before on Monster Fest, but it was before I called it Monster Fest, and I decided to do another review instead of re-uploading that one because I felt I could have done a better job because I don't remember, but I don't think I'd read the novel at that point. And of course, is a 1973 horror film directed by William Friedkin, based on the 71 novel, the same name, by... Uh, William Peter Blotty, The Exorcist. Now, this is one of the most critically praised horror films of all time, and it's one of the few, <clears throat> excuse me, to earn Academy Award nominations. It won two Best Sound and Best Adapted Screenplay, which the screenplay one I agree with, and the sound one, give or take. And then, of course, it was also nominated for Best Picture, but it lost to The Sting. It's also one of the highest grossing movies of all time, earning over $441 million worldwide, and that was back in the 70s. I mean, most of that was probably in the 70s, but I guess you can see. And it's usually, it's usually mentioned a lot in popular culture. I mean, AMC in 2006 was view, voted the scariest film of all time, which that's kind of debatable. Number three, it's a number three on Broadway's 100 Scariest Movie Moments, which I can see why, because even if you're an atheist or don't have any faith whatsoever, you could see, I could see how this movie what might touch you, because it has some of that primordial fear of being taken over by something else. And also, it kind of would hit close to home, especially if you, more so if you actually have faith than if you don't. Not that I'm saying anything, but just saying. Now... Aspects of the original novel, which I have read, which it actually is a very good novel. Even if you don't like the movie, but you like reading, I suggest you find a copy of the novel. I know that recently that Blotty uh, edited the novel and rewrote some of the dialogue and prose and republished it. Mostly because he didn't have the time to do a second draft originally. Which I actually want to get a copy of that, so I have both copies. And I do have a copy of the sequel over there, which I have to read one day, but... Aspects of the novel were inspired by an exorcism performed on a young boy from Cottage City, Maryland in 1949 by a Jesuit priest named William S. Bodern, who formerly taught at both the St. Louis University and the St. Louis University High School. Uh, the boy's Catholic family was convinced the child's aggressive behavior was attributed to demonic possession, and they called upon the services of the priest to exorcise him. And, of course, the priest maintained until his death in 05 that he never witnessed the boy display any of the supernatural behavior portrayed in the film. No foreign languages, change in tone of voice, aversion to holy objects, and usual strength, vomiting, or urinating. So, you could tell that that's probably a little bit exaggerated, but it works. I mean, if an actual demon did actually possess someone, it would probably... Well, maybe not if they didn't want to display that much power, but they might to actually make you see that it actually is that, not just in the mind. Ah! Now, the cast of the film includes, we have Ellen Burstein as Chris McNeil, who is a famous actress living in Washington, D.C., which I'm checking, I'm going to check real quick to see what else she's been in, because off the top of my head, I don't really recognize her from anything. Not my fault, it's probably just I've never seen her anything. Oh, she's an Academy Award-nominated actress, apparently. Uh, she got one for the last picture show. She got her second one for this movie, which I could see why, because she was a believable mother in this movie. Just help her! Let's see. I am looking through. Um, no, she. Oh, she was put in that documentary, Terror in the Isles. <laughs> um, the Babysitters Club. Uh, walking across Egypt, Mermaid, Requiem for a Dream. Oh, she must have been the mother in that movie. Oh yeah. Oh no, this is interesting. She voiced Grandma Dollarhide in Red Dragon. Ah, uh, that's kind of interesting. I did not know that was her. That is interesting. The, oh, she was in the remake of The Wicker Man. <laughs> oh, that's kind of funny. An episode of Law & Order Special Victims Union. And that's about it. That's all I recognize her from. Then, of course, we've got Jason Miller as Father Damien Karras. He does a wonderful job. I'm surprised he didn't get an Oscar nomination for this movie. I don't think he did. Um... That doesn't say anything. Um, the late Jason Miller, I should say, he died back in 01, so rest in peace, man. He was also a playwright, so. Hmm. 
Let's see what he was. This was his first move. Oh, he was nominated for an Academy Award. Excuse me, he was nominated. He deserved a nomination. Excuse me. Uh, this was apparently was his first movie. At least according to this filmography. Um, and let's see. Then he was also in The Devil's Advocate. A West Germany production, apparently. Yeah. The Ninth Configuration. Then, of course, he was also in Exorcist 3, reprising his role. Uh, Toy Soldiers. Um, a movie called Mommy. That's about it. That I can think of here. He won the Pulitzer Prize in 73 for his play of the championship season, so that's cool. Uh, that's, and of course, Max von Sydow was Father Marin. Beautiful performance. Um, uh, you know, I'm going to go down to the... Hold on, I'm going down to... Um, I'm going to down to check to see what it got. Okay, um, before I go on to him... Uh, Ellen, Jason, and Linda Blair were the only ones who got acting nominations for this, which I, I will get to why Blair didn't win hers when I get to her talking about it. As you guys can tell, I'm talking about the actors a little bit first, because I want to go a little bit in. We all know Max von Sydow. I've always been a fan of him as an actor. This is actually the first movie I saw him in, which is kind of interesting considering he had a big career before this. Uh, after this movie, he did movies such as Voyage of the Damned, Exorcist to the Heretic. Mm. Flash Gordon is Ming the Merciless. Pathetic Earthling. Conan the Barbarian is King Osric. Samson and Delilah. Ghostbusters 2. He was the voice of Vigo the Carpathian? Cool. I don't, it's been a long time since I've seen that movie. Yeah. Citizen X. Judge Dredd. He played Judge Fargo. Uh, the Princess and the Pauper. Uh, what Dreams May Come is the tracker. Minority Report is the director. Reynard in Rush Hour 3. Uh, he was in Ghostbusters, the video game. Of course, he was Sir Walter Loxley in uh, Robin Hood, which I did like him in that role. He was in Shutter Island. He was in the extended cut of The Wolfman as the man who gives uh, Larry Talbot the silver cane. Funny thing about that is even though his part was removed from the theatrical cut, there was still a credit for assistant to Mr. Von Sydow in the, in the credits. I bet people who were watching the credits were like, what? Why is there someone talking about Max Von Sydow in there? Yeah, Max Von Sydow did a very good job. I'm surprised he didn't get anything, but probably because he, probably he was hardly in the movie. Then again, <laughs> then again, uh, Anthony Hopkins is hardly in Silence of the Lambs and he won the Academy Award for it, but... Anyway, Linda Blair as Reagan McNeil. She does a very good job, and she was nominated for the Academy Award, which I could see why. But she didn't win because it turned out she didn't do the voice of, her, of the demon that was Mercedes McKay and Bridge, which I could see why they decided not to give her the award for that. But the physical performance was still her. So, for the physical performance alone, she did a very good job. And also, you know, her own character before she's possessed. Aesthetically, she, on, remember, on, in front of the camera, she's playing two characters. Reagan normal, then Reagan is possessed by the demon. So she did a very good job. Uh, Lee J. Cobb as Lieutenant William F. Kinderman. He does a pretty good job. He's only in a few scenes, but he's there. I like I like George C. Scott in Exorcist Three better as this character, but I like him. Uh, then of course other actors. We got Kitty Wynn as uh, one of Chris's friends who acts as Reagan's governess and tutor. We got Jack McGowan as Burke Dennings, who's the film director and a close friend of Chris, and he's the character that something happens to him during the course of the film. He's kind of a dick character. I mean, this is not really nailed home, and it's nailed home a little bit in the movie, but it's more obvious in the novel. Especially when he's drunk and he keeps telling the one male worker of Chris's about, Yeah, hey, weren't you a Nazi? When, in fact, if I remember correctly in the novel, it mentions he was a Holocaust survivor, so... You can understand why he gets in the guy's face like that, like, you oh, gotcha! Yeah, it's like that what something that one idiot did at a thing that one of my teachers went to once where they were being lectured by a Holocaust survivor or a stupid neo-Nazi had to stand up and goes, Hitler lives, and then gets punched by a big black guy. That's actually, that actually happened. And of course, the other actors, we got... And there's actually an actual priest in here, apparently. Father William O'Malley is uh, Joseph Dreyer, who's a friend of Karis. So I like that. And then, of course, Tito Vandis is Karis' uncle. Now, uh, on to the plot. 
The plot is that we start in, at a dig in northern Iraq where we're introduced to Father Marin where he visits a site where a medallion is found next to this small stone of a grimacing creature. And of course from this we could see that something uh, that uh, to steal a line from Shakespeare something is wicked in the state of Denmark. Meanwhile then we're introduced to Father Damien Karras who's a young priest at Georgetown University in Washington D.C. He's going through a crisis of faith, as he tells his friend. I think I lost my faith, Tom. And you, you, you could ask yourself, if he's losing his faith, why is he still a priest? Granted, there are some people that become priests. I'm sure that because they want to strengthen their faith. I mean, not to say anything. One of the characters in my novel actually did that, but it, it seems to be wavering. Not only because of that, because of his mother's illness and. At one point, he's starting to blame himself for her illness, like, I should be closer to her. And, of course, his mother eventually does die. Slight spoiler, but you can imagine that he's already having a crisis of faith. That's going to make it worse, which just plays into the whole thing of the novel. Because one of the things about the novel movie, one of the things, one of the themes I'd have to say is faith. More so in the movie, because the novel, it's left up to the viewer whether or not Reagan was actually possessed. Here, it's actually stated she fully is possessed. So faith is one of the running things. And anyway, we are also introduced to Chris McNeil, who is an actress filming a movie there, which is not stated what it is in the uh, movie, not really needed to. In the novel, apparently it's a remake of uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, which I have to say that would be an interesting movie to remake, well, not really needed, but it'd be an interesting movie to remake in a more contemporary setting, you know, dealing with all the stuff like filibuster and stuff, it'd be interesting. It was weird the way they were doing it in the novel, though, but that's just me. And, of course, Chris notices some dangerous changes in behavior involving her daughter, Reagan. Chris initially believes that her, some, the changes are related to puberty, but these are the weirdest puberty changes I've ever seen, if that's the case. However, the doctors are suspecting it's a lesion in the temporal lo lobe. As he tells her, the problem with your daughter is not her bed, it's her brain. And, of course, they do tests and they find nothing wrong. But as time goes on, Reagan gets worse and worse until she starts having violent outbursts where she slaps him and yells like, The sow is mine! Fuck me! Fuck me! Stuff like that. And of course, something happens to Barco, which I'm not going to state, but kind of violent. Even though he was a dick, he doesn't really deserve this. And of course, eventually, Chris has no ch choice but to turn to Faith, so she talks with Karis, who not only is a priest, he's also a psychiatrist, so he can look at it from both ways. He goes to talk to Reagan out, out of uniform, but she talks to him as the demon, and she knows he's a priest. And also that his mother just died, which something something Reagan didn't know, and she also speaks in Latin during the second visit. And also, the thing that finally convinces Karis to go to the bishop to ask for an exorcism is, help me, written on her stomach. Which, of course, I know some people are going to think about the fly. Help me! Help me! <laughs> but I can imagine Reagan saying it. But because of Karis' lapse of faith, you obviously know he's not going to be allowed to perform the exorcism. So we bring in Father Marin once again, and it's now up to him and Karis to perform the exorcism. And, of course, I'm not going to spoil what happens, but it does show that Karis has regained his faith. The f final part of the movie, which... The whole thing about it is that, like I said, faith, because Chris is not religious, Karis is losing his religion, and they both have to turn to faith in order to save the girl. Chris reluctantly, over time, when she sees nothing else is working, probably at first she's thinking it's probably just a mind over matter thing, but as time goes on she sees it might actually be true. Karis doing the same thing at first, because you know him being a psychiatrist, he's going to think it's just something in her mind, and until he sees all this stuff, mostly during the exorcism. So he probably just thinks that the exorcism would probably do the same thing, you know, mind over matter. You know, if she thinks she's being exercised, then she'll return to normal. And I do like how they... Excuse me for a second. Okay, sorry about that little disturbance. My grandma got home, I had to go open the gate and bring a few things in. I actually lost my place now. <laughs> so I don't like being interrupted during this stuff. I think I was talking about faith and stuff, but, you know, um, the face, it's, it's easier to explain easier to, for you to watch the movie than me to fully explain but it works and it's good character development for him. Especially Karis and it does kind of carry over slightly in the next movie. Slightly because he's not fully there. He's mostly just there for the final part. Now uh, 
The direction by William Friedkin, I actually did like. I like how he uses the camera. I like how he got the good performances out of the actors. So I'd say he's a pretty good director. The movie he directed right before this was a movie called The French Connection, which is one I've actually been wanting to see. After this, he directed a movie called The Sorcerer, which... Kind of a weird follow-up to The Exorcist, The Sorcerer. Let's see, let's see what, what that movie's about. Hey, Roy Schneider's in it. Cool. That, I'll definitely give that movie a watch if I can find it. The, then, of course, in the 80s, he did a movie called The Live and Die in L.A., which I've heard minor things about. And, of course, in 1990, he did a movie, which I'm one of the few fans of that movie, The Guardian. You know, that movie about the demon trying to steal the baby, which I did review that a couple years ago. If I have time, I'll get to it. The last movie he directed was one that came out this year called Killer Joe, which I want to see if that movie came out already or not. I'm happy to see he's still directing stuff, because I think he's a pretty good director, at least from this movie alone. Oh, it's a, dark, it's a gothic dark comedy. Oh, it came out here in the United States in July. Oh, Matthew McConaughey was in it. Oh, I think I remember seeing trailers for that. He, in the 2000s, he directed a movie's uh, Rules of Engagement, a movie called The Hunted, which I'm going to check right now to see who was in that. Oh, it's that movie with Tommy Lee Jones and Benicio Del Toro, the one that's kind of like re the one that's kind of like how the novel First Blood was. Huh. Yeah, that makes... That makes me want to see that a little bit more now, actually. Huh. Is the director actually no? Hmm. And he actually did get nominated for the Academy Award for Best Director. <coughs> so I have, to, I have to say, well deserved. I does not say who he lost to though. But he also got the Golden Globe nom. He also got go a nomination for the Golden Globe for uh, Best Director. So two nominations in a row. Well played. Good on you. Now the score was composed by. Uh, it says up here, uh, Jack Nid Nitz Nitz Nitz. I know it's a weird thing to pronounce. Now, originally it was done by Lalo Schifrin, but uh, Friedkin uh, vetoed it. He didn't like it, I guess. And then, of course, Warner Brothers executive executives told Friedkin to instruct Schifrin to tone it down with softer music. But, free, but he did not delay. He did not relay that message. Uh, let's see. Apparently, free, you know, let's see. Now, Freakin said that if he had heard the music of Tangerine Dream earlier, he would have had them score the Exorcist. That's I think that's what he did for the Sorcerer. But he used more modern classical compositions. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm yeah I'm reading. I'm trying to see. Oh yeah, it was some of the original score was Jack. Net Zist. It's his last name is spelled. <coughs> excuse me. His last name is spelled N I T Z S C H E. Z kind of hard to pronounce, but it is kind of a memorable score, and it's one of the examples of why piano music in horror movies is creepy. It's like da na 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 it's just kind of creepy. I mean, if you if you were in a dark room at night and you woke up after hearing something and then you stood up and started to walk and started hearing that music, you'd probably freak out. Even more so with Phantasm or Halloween, but it's one of those ones. I'd actually like to hear that thing on an organ. I mean, Halloween sound epic on an organ. Imagine how this would sound on an organ. And, of course, one thing I need to mention is that the famous exorcist steps are actually in Washington, D.C. somewhere. And, of course... Apparently, Georgetown University students charge people five dollars each to watch the stunt at the end of the movie from rooftops, which is kind of funny. And people actually go to the Exorcist steps and take pictures, which I would like to do that one day, you know. And of course, there's a bunch of urban legends and on-set incidents regarding the movie. I mean, many of the film's participants said the film was cursed. Uh, Blightly even stated that there were some strange occurrences during filming, like. Uh, there was a studio fire that caused the McNeil residence sets to be rebuilt. Uh, Freaking claimed the priest was brought in numerous times to bless the set, which makes me wonder, what was the was the devil doing something on set? Like, you will not film a movie about me without me. Ha, 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 ha. And, uh, there's a lot of stuff. It doesn't really state much of it. No. Like, uh, Ellen was... 
heart during the crucifix scene, which you guys have seen the movie, you know what scene I'm talking about. When the heart is pulled to her too hard, which I could see probably why. Uh, Blair was uh, injured injured her back when during one of the thrashing scenes. And of course, Jack McG McGowan died from the flu shortly after he filmed his role as Burke. So I can see why they would say the movie is cursed. It, this and Poltergeist, two movies about stuff like that. Bad luck. I know. I'm not, I know. I'm, I'm not trying to make a joke. I'm just saying. And of course, you know that there's an extended cut of this movie, which I've only seen once, because the version of the film I watched just now is the normal version, even though it did have a introduction by Friedkin, which is interesting. Probably one of the most famous scenes put back into the movie for the extended cut is the spider walk scene, which from one of the reasons it was cut is because it didn't really look good, but I thought the way to put it back in, it looked good. I do actually want to get this movie on DVD because I only have an AVI of it. I want to try to get that one that the DVD that has both the original and the extended cut on them so I could, you know, watch it. Either one. And of course, this movie is successful, so you know eventually they had to make a bunch of sequels. Cause let's see, we got. Uh, yeah, I'm looking. Let's see. Where is it? Where is it? Where? Is it? Where is it? Yeah, I'm looking for sequels. Huh? Uh, uh, sequels. There we go. We got this Exorcist: The Heretic, which was released in '77, which is basically continues the plot with Reagan. Sad thing about that is the movie was made by someone who's not even a fan of the first movie, so it suffers from being a little bit too different. That's one of the reasons I didn't. I don't remember liking it. Then we had The Exorcist 3, which was directed by Blatley himself, based off his novel Legion, which is actually pretty good, even though the studio caused him to re-edit the movie to add in an exorcism, which kind of sad from what I hear that they haven't been able to find the other footage, because I'd like to see them release a DVD with both the original and the theatrical version of the film. That'd be interesting to watch. Who knows, maybe the original version would have been better. Then, of course, we got two prequels released. We got Exorcist the Beginning, which I did see the latter half of that movie in theaters, which I actually thought it was an okay movie. I gotta rewatch it one day. It was directed by Rennie Harlan. Then we got the other one, Dominion prequel to The Exorcist, which is the only one of the two that Blatley actually likes, which I've seen parts of it. So Apparently, the beginning is more like a gore-fest horror film, while the other one is more psychological, which I guess it's like, pick your poison. But critics trust the beginning while they were more kinder to Dominion, which the only reason they re did the beginning was because that was the type of movie that apparently the financial backers wanted, which I'm like, did you guys watch The Exorcist? It wasn't gory. <clears throat> and of course there was also a spoof from the movie Repossessed which I haven't seen that movie but I hear it's really not really nothing to run home about anyway my rating for The Exorcist is 5 out of 5 cause can't really think of anything wrong with the movie it's a perfect horror movie and it shows that you do not need to rely on gratuitous bloodshed or a bunch of loud noises you could do it just with psychological all it could be you could make horror scary with just psychological stuff and with it has well, it has very good acting, very good cinematography, and this is a movie is an example of why I think that the horror genre really needs to get more praise, because it just seems that the horror genre, well, a lot of the critics trash it, which some of the films I will admit do deserve to be trashed, like uh, Devil Inside, but they really need to make them. At the time it was released, I guess you could say this was a game changer at the time. Oh, yeah. What? I know, Grandma. You don't have to tell me that, please. Grandma, when I'm talk, sorry about that. I've told my grandma not to knock if she needs to tell me something, but she keeps doing that. Anyway, as I was saying, at the time it was released, this was a game changer. What we need is another film that is a game changer that people will let. And I don't mean Cabin in the Woods. I hear that's supposed to be called a game changer, but no comment yet. But. I've heard negative things about it, so I don't think it is. Anyway, like I said, there's a little bit of 5 out of 5. If you're a horror fan and you haven't seen this movie, I say give it a watch. And then, if you want to watch the sequels, I say watch them. Watch Exorcist 3, then watch the other sequels. That's what I say.